Welcome to the seventh talk of Human Factors in Design. My name is Joseph Jackman, and today we'll be talking about a very important human sensory capability, which is hearing, what we can hear. We've said previously maybe as much as 70, on some occasions 75%, of the information we use in any given circumstance to make sense of things and take decisions would be visual vision of the remaining part though the very next one in importance maybe 10 on some occasions possibly as high as 15 percent of the information processing would be from sound from hearing so a very important human sense which we will talk about today. We'll introduce a little bit how it works, where it comes from, how it's transduced and sent to the brain. And then we will talk a little bit about some of the design considerations and implications. So first of all, how do we hear? What is the structure of the ear? And how do we get this subjective sensation coming from outside of us and arriving inside of us in our thoughts? Okay, the first thing to review is to look at the structure of the ear. The ear traditionally, to simplify discussions, has been divided into various sections. The outer ear, what's more visible from the outside, the middle ear, where a lot of the clever things are happening, and the inner ear, where mechanical movements and motions somehow from cells of the body get converted into electrochemical signals, into electricity, which can be sent up to the brain centers, to the cortex, the, uh, the um, hearing cortex, the sound cortex, and process. So let's start with the first bit, which is the outer ear. On the outer ear, there's the pinna. The outer ear, there's, as you can see on the diagram, the auditory canal, which what we're familiar with when we take a shower in the morning and there's the eardrum which seals and represents the frontier or the border between the outer ear and the middle ear. Now each of these components has a fundamental role to play in the hearing we have. Without the pinna on the outside which should remind you of a musical instrument, should remind you of an acoustic instruments such as a trumpet or a trombone or a tuba because it's exactly the same we have something which has to blend or merge the worlds of the auditory canal which is a conduit with a certain cross-sectional diameter and the outer world where the sound is coming with a, at us with wavelengths of centimeters or meters or more and it's trying to bridge the two. So we have a sort of funnel which captures things on the outside and directs and helps to channel the sound perturbation inside into the auditory canal. So the pinna is very important. Without it, we lose uh, quite a bit of sensitivity to the incoming sound. And it's an impedance matching device to match the infinite impedance of the outside world with the specific impedance of the auditory canal, where impedance is a technical term to refer to the resistance which that path provides to the movement of the atoms which create the sound. So we have a pinna, which is very important, an auditory canal. The auditory canal, its diameter and length are such that if you do the sound calculations and you look at what resonances might happen in that size and shape of a conduit, you'll find very quickly that that tube tends to create resonant frequencies which amplify the incoming sound at frequencies from 1000 to 6000 hertz and we'll very soon be seeing in a few minutes time that those are exactly the frequencies which your vocal cords make when you're talking. Therefore, evolution has given us an ear which amplifies human sounds coming from vocal cords which vibrate at the exact same frequencies. And we'll see so much of what's happening, the crying of a baby, the words in our language, so much of what 
we're trying to pick up, listen to, and interpret is exactly in that frequency range from one to six kilohertz in frequency. And then at the end of the tunnel, as it were, there is the tympanum in Latin or the eardrum in common language. The eardrum is a sealed diaphragm, drum, just like the skin on top of a musical instrument of a drum. It seals the tube and what happens is the sound waves get collected from outside, the pinna directs them down the channel, down the auditory canal they move, and at the end, bang, they run into the eardrum and they make it move a little bit in and out, just like playing a drum and banging your congos or your uh, bongos or whatever is your musical instrument. So we have a situation where a diaphragm will be made to move, by the oscillations and the sound pressures, and then something will happen after that, and eventually we'll see it gets converted into electricity. So in the middle here is where a lot of issues from a human factors ergonomics perspective tends to occur. After the eardrum, we have three very small bone structures, tiny millimeter length structures called the ossicles. The ossicles, you can see them in the, in the image, the, the names assigned to them from Latin are malleus, incus, and stapes, malleus being the hammer. These three bones are at odd angles to each other, and what's happening here with the ossicles is that the sizes of the bones and the angles they're making are using the principles once again, as we discussed in biomechanics, of the lever arm. And they're using lever arms with angles to make multiplication, to take the little tiny motions of the air molecules, which are around the size of a diameter of an oxygen molecule. And they're taking those motions and multiplying them through these angles to make them larger. And the uh, amount of increase that we see can be as much as 10 to 30 times amplification. In the middle ear, the ossicles, as we said, amplify, and they have two mechanisms for doing that. One is what I just said, which is the lever arms and the nonlinear relationships of the input to the output through these angles. And the other, possibility for amplification is that the eardrum has a certain cross-sectional diameter. It's a drum that's relatively large in middle ear terms. The ossicles at the end of the process, one bumping the other, bumping the other, pushing forward, at the end they push on a structure called the oval window which is the outer connection of the cochlea. The oval window is again, it looks a lot like a piston or a drum, but it's much smaller. So we have a system in the middle ear where something with a big cross-sectional area pushes something that's very small, thus amplifying a little movement of the big one turns out to be a big movement of the smaller one of the oval window further down the line and in between to help increase the amplification we have some non-linear relationships between angles which use the good old principle of the lever arm as we've already discussed and at the end of the day we can have multiplications of 15, 20, perhaps even more. So we take what are very, very tiny oscillations in the air molecules, and by the time they get to the cochlea, which is where the sensors are to change from a mechanical movement to an electrochemical signal of neurons, which can be processed by the brain in the sensory cortex, the intermediate which does this job is providing quite a bit of amplification. And if you're exposed to too much sound and you get damage to this middle ear machinery, you will not hear so well anymore because this amplifying step in the middle ear is quite fundamental and critical to the whole process. 
Once the ossicles uh, produce this amplification, the signals would then create electricity at the level of the cochlea. So to some extent, the last chance we have to reduce things before they get to the sensor and possibly overload the sensor electrically, the last chance we have to do some protection is actually there in the middle ear. So what happens in the middle ear is the malleus, the incus, the stapes, this mechanical machinery of lever arms between the eardrum and the oval window, this machinery can be varied. There are small muscles, which aren't really illustrated in this image because it would get very complicated, the drawing would be hard to, to fully comprehend. So we've removed in this drawing the muscle groups, but there are small muscle fibers attached to each of these three bones, these three small ossicles, each of the muscle fiber, its tension, how strongly it holds on to the bone and maintains the tension and makes the bone movement stiff, how much it resists the movement of that bone with respect to another one, that control is centrally controlled by the brain. And what happens is, if I'm going to a concert, a music concert, or if I'm in an outdoor setting in Trafalgar Square and there's lots of noise and people screaming around me, once the noise gets to be of a large number of decibels, and we'll talk about that in a moment, my nervous system stiffens up those muscles and sort of locks a little bit the bones and resists them moving to protect them. Because if we lose this amplifying machinery in the middle ear, we will then have hearing loss and hearing problems for the rest of our life. So our nervous system tries to automatically, outside of our consciousness, without particular awareness on our part, it tries to protect us by stiffening or loosening the grip on these particular structures, these three bones, uh, dependent on how much they're moving, meaning how loud the sound is. So the middle ear is not just providing a very complex and important amplification process, but it's also a place where much of the defense and the adjustment of the ear, the hearing system, is occurring. A little bit like the pupil of the eye can open and close and the lens can be adjusted. Here too, we have involuntary subconscious mechanisms occurring which are trying to adjust always to get the best amplification and above all to tighten up everything and protect the, mecha the mechanisms when the sound gets too loud. Now the tympanum or the eardrum moves the malleus which pushes on the incus which then pushes on the stapes and pushes against the small piston of the oval window. The end result, the whole point of this, is to get some movement, some sloshing about of the fluid, of the saline solution of the liquid that's in a canal. What we have here is, in the image, we have this snail spiral shape, which is the cross-section of the cochlea. The cochlea is a structure that has three canals separated by a diaphragm, one from the other, and what it is, in reality, is a long beam, for those of you of an engineering persuasion, it's a long, what, it, what probably millions of years ago was straight beam, and it's been rolled up and spiraled to tighten it up and get it to fit all in the small cavity in our cranium where it's protected. Please note that these structures are in a pocket of the skull, well protected from knocks and bumps and scrapes that happen in the outside world because the eyes and the, the sound, the hearing, are fundamental to survival. So this cochlea is well protected by a thick layer of bone structure around it. And to pack it in there and to get it to fit without occupying too much space and volume, it's spiraled and tightened up and rolled on itself. But basically it's a long beam with three channels, each with saline solution in it. And when the oval window gives a bit of push, 
one way or the other. The fluid sort of sloshes back and forth following the movement of the oval window. And the whole point of the exercise is on the basilar membrane, on one of the membranes, is an organ called the organ of corti. And what this is composed of, and it's not too important, we focus too much on the medical histological properties of the cells, but let's just mention that what's important here is there's a large number of cells. Each of these cells has a cilia or a hair which protrudes into the fluid that's moving about back and forth thanks to the motion of the oval window. And each of these cells, when the fluid bends it one way or bends it the other way, the cell has a mechanism by which the bending depolarizes the membrane. The depolarization is an electrochemical signal. It then propagates away up the neuron, because they're all sensory neurons, these as well, and eventually reaches up at the cortex, the auditory sensory region of the cortex for processing. So what we have is we collect the sound, we send it down a channel which amplifies certain key frequencies, it moves a drum, the drum is then its motion amplified through a set of mechanical clever devices that pushes onto a fluid, the fluid bends some things that are protruding into it, the sensor then miraculously produces an electrical signal. And there's many of these uh, hair cells along the organ of Corti, estimates, but these are estimates, 23,500, so it's in the thousands. These devices are the transduction mechanisms or the sensors which get us from something mechanical moving some masses to something electrical moving electrons along the membrane of the cell. Sound is again, um, uh, hearing is a very impressive sensory modality and it operates over ranges of intensities of many order of magnitudes, typically over 12 to 14 orders of magnitude. So given this, the ear or hearing, the whole apparatus is a very sensitive organ, it's been the case that the units of measurement of sound have typically been defined in terms of powers of 10, as we often use in physics. So the sound power, the power of a given sound, is usually defined in terms of orders of magnitude, powers of 10, meaning using a base 10 logarithm. The power of 10, in the case of sound, already in the early 20th century was taken to be the unit and it was given the name Bell at, in honor of Alexander Graham Bell who's well known for the, his um, design of the telephone. So we talk about a unit of one bell as being one order of magnitude or adding a zero to a number of a sound power. The scale, therefore, is measured in this manner here. The bell is a rather large unit. It turned out in the early 20th century that uh, people noted that uh, going a full order of magnitude sometimes didn't give you such a fine-grained analysis as might be beneficial in certain cases. So what they did was they said, okay, we should be using an order of magnitude. Sometimes we need a slightly more fine-grained scale. Let's divide it by 10. Let's divide the bell into 10 pieces, each of one tenth of a bell, a deci bell. And the, scale, the unit was defined then as the deci bell, small d, large b for bell. So the formula uh, technically is 10, log base 10, we're using the base 10 from physics, the power of the sound signal, how much it pushes in terms of power units, over a reference power, where the reference power is typically taken to be 10 to the minus 12 watts. Now the question, the first question probably comes to mind is, why is there a reference power? Uh, where does reference power business come from? The reference power, 
was put in there because we want to refer it to people. And it remains there whether we do the calculation in terms of power or whether we do the calculation in terms of sound pressure. When we take a microphone and we put it in a sound field and we let the diaphragm move back and forth inside a coil and create electricity due to the movement in the magnetic field, this uh, pressure is our most direct measurement of the sound. It's much easier, more practical to measure pressure than it is to measure the power itself of the sound. So we typically take it as pressure in units of pressure, since scientifically, mathematically, pressure is normally calculated as the square, excuse me, uh, power is normally calculated as the square of the pressure. Decibel, when you're using a microphone and just taking the sound pressure rather than the sound power directly, because it's easier, it becomes 20 logarithm base 10, the pressure over the reference pressure. When we're talking about pressure, we talk about 20 micropascals of the reference pressure. So whether we have the ability, and nowadays in some cases it's, it's possible to do it directly as a sound power, or whether we do the more practical thing, which is measure the fluctuations in the pressure of the air using our microphone, the unit remains the same. It's decibel. In one case, it's 10 log base 10 of. In the other case, it's 20 log base 10 of. And in both cases, there's a number in the denominator of the equation, which is the reference. So why is there something in the denominator providing a reference? The number in the denominator is to make it relative to people. It's the sound pressure or the sound power in the case of 10 log base 10. It's the value at the threshold of human perception. So we could just do them as absolute numbers and fix an absolute zero, but what's the point? We're human factors, we're uh, ergonomic, we're electrical engineers designing telephones. We wish to do things for people. So the number is more useful and more intuitive and easier to understand if it means something with respect to the people. So we move the zero from some theoretical absolute to the minimum sound a person can perceive with their ear, an average person on an average day in an average test and we take that value as the reference and the number turns out to be one number if it's with the microphone pressure and a slightly different number if we're talking about power but it's always referring to the minimum you can actually hear something occurring in the sound so sound decibel values very important to note whether we're working with the power or the pressure we're talking about an equation there's a, some square in there, there's a logarithm in there. You can't just add two or three numbers together to sum them up because you're supposed to be adding what's inside the brackets, what's inside the equation. So it's very important not to get confused, people who don't work uh, habitually day to day with acoustic signals might occasionally forget this. It's important as a human factors ergonomics person to recall after having referred it to people with the reference value, we still have to be careful not to just add or subtract numbers. That's not the way it operates. So uh, sound pressure levels, for example, in decibels, we have to either add them inside the equation and then take the logarithm or use some simple sleight of hand, some simple scale or nomogram or table to do the job without a calculator. And in the olden days, before the wide-scale availability of calculators and computers, the thing people would tend to do would be use a nomogram, because you might just have one in your, in your notebook or on the side of the microphone or in the instrument. You might just have one handy. The nomogram, how does it operate? It's just a representation of what happens when you actually add the numbers that are inside the brackets, inside the equation, and then take the logarithm and either the 20 or the 10 
on the outside. So what you would do in the case of a nomogram is what's illustrated here at the bottom of the slide. If I was designing a ship and I was in the machinery space where there's some compressors or motors or some sort of engines and I had two of them, one on each side of me, and each of them, when I turn them on and turn everything off else off, if each of them was producing at the microphone 100 decibels of sound of noise, when I turn both of them on together, it wouldn't be 100 decibels plus 100 decibels equals 200 decibels. That's not the way it operates. It'd be take 100, take the other 100, use the nomogram, say, what's the difference between them? A hundred and a hundred, oh, in this case, it just happens to be zero. A hundred minus a hundred is no difference, it's zero. What do I get when I add two sounds whose difference is zero using my little shorthand nomogram? If the level one machine minus the level of the other gives me a zero, that means it's plus three decibels. So I would say a hundred decibel machine by itself, a hundred decibel machine on the other side by itself. When I bring them together, I should be reading on the microphone 103 decibels, not 200, because I was supposed to add what's inside the equation, not the final result on the outside. So that's how we go about adding numbers, and it's uh, important to recall that, because sometimes field measurements of something you're designing may involve several sound sources, several noisy things that are operating at the same time, and if you just have the individual numbers, you'll have to add them in sequence, one to the other, then add the other to the result, to the result using a nomogram, or just add them all up with your hand calculator by adding what's inside the expression. Now, looking at the characteristics, which from a human factors perspective are incredibly important, this is a simplified diagram suggesting what is the frequency and sound pressure approximate envelopes of a series of things of interest to designers. First of all, speech. Talking, as I'm doing right now into the microphone of this recording device, which frequency range and which amplitude range does my sound coming from my vocal cords and out my mouth, where is that placed? Well, the innermost uh, shape on this particular diagram gives you the envelope of speech. The vast majority of speech of the vast majority of people, the vast majority of the time, will be within that envelope. So you can see an envelope from about 7,000 hertz down to maybe 100 hertz, roughly, and occupying a space from about 60 to 100 decibels, something like that. Music. The range of music, as you can see, is a little bit wider because musical instruments, something like the piano, which is the, the pianoforte, which is the uh, traditional acoustic instrument with the widest dynamic range. Uh, the piano, uh, across the 88 keys, we're moving from very low sounds on the left side of the keyboard to very high pitched sounds on the right hand side and you can see that the frequency range is significantly extended with respect to that of speech and also the amplitude range that we can make across the strings on those long string runs with a grand piano we can make a much louder sound than what the typical person can pronounce and then finally the outer envelope that's being suggested on the diagram is giving us the complete range of human hearing. This is not the dog, it's not the parrot, it's not the cat. Different creatures will have quite different characteristics in terms of their maximum minimum frequencies and their maximum and minimum amplitudes in terms of decibels of sound pressure that they can uh, clearly hear. Uh, but this is the human one, and you can see that there's quite a range from, you know, just above zero on this diagram. I think they shifted it slightly to make it easier to see. Just above zero to about 140 decibels, 14 orders of magnitude. So very impressive amplitude range, similar to what happened with vision. And a rather impressive frequency range, 
from about 20 hertz, 20 cycles per second of oscillation. A hertz is a unit of one cycle, one times up and one times down with the pressure per second, from 20 cycles per second to as much as 18, 17, 18,000 cycles per second is the typical frequency range. Now, in terms of things that happen and important, character, uh, important points to note, the frequency range for a young adult, typically a teenager, will be 20 hertz to almost 20,000 hertz. That drops a lot with older adults. With older adults, uh, the upper frequencies tend to drop. Somebody of my age, if I'm picking up as high as 12,000 hertz, I'd be quite happy. I'm not sure I am. As you get older, the lower frequency, the 20, tends to remain fairly invariant. It doesn't change too much. But as the ear uh, loses ability due to the eardrum getting stiffer, the muscles of the bones not being as flexible, the organ of corti not being as healthy and young and flexible as it used to be, some of the electrical transducing cells having died off and not being fully replaced. As the performance of the middle and inner ear starts to drop, what we tend to lose are the higher frequencies the ones that move the fastest up and down in terms of pressure. They're harder to follow if the system is stiff and heavy and losing sensitivity. So the 20 of the low range tends to remain. The upper range after about 12, 14 years of age just tends to drop a little bit with each year that passes and gets less and less and less. Now below 20 hertz, it's interesting to note from a design point of view, it isn't that there isn't any movement in the air. Uh, lots of things move through the air, cars and traffic on the street, uh, the um, wind turbine generating electrical energy out in the countryside or out to sea. Lots of things move at frequencies below 20 ups and downs each second. The fact that we don't hear them with our ear doesn't mean they're not happening. And not only that, but the fact we don't hear it with the ear doesn't mean we're not picking it up at all. We do feel these things, but not the sound. We feel them as a bit of motion in our chest. What's referred to as infrasound, sound at frequencies less than the hearing range, infrasound is picked up by feelings, somewhat uneasy feelings, a bit of pressure feeling occurring in our chest. So if we live near a wind turbine out in the countryside or near the beach, we may have trouble sleeping at night because we feel a bit uncomfortable. The air going into our lungs and out and in and out at five cycles per second, ten cycles per second, three usually is the blade pass frequency cycles per second, we will perhaps feel it and notice something, but it'll be a feeling of unease it won't really be a sound because it's not uh, picked up by the ear. And finally, as I've already said, um, hearing range, the maximum frequency drops consistently with age and also to some extent the maximum sound pressures we can pick up drop consistently with age. So as designers we have to ask questions all the time about who are our personas who are our target audience for our interaction design. If we're putting in an alarm system, uh, an acoustic feedback, a speech interface, a chat bot, whatever it is, we have to select the characteristics of the sounds that are produced by the interface based on some understanding of the age profile, the gender and so forth of the target audience because older people will have greater difficulty in picking up the lower frequencies. Now, when we talk about sound, uh, we have to clarify that usually uh, we talk about it using terminologies such as loudness, which are subjective parameters, a bit like color with vision. This isn't necessarily 
a scientific property. This isn't the amplitude, the, the raw decibel of the measurement with the microphone. Usually when we do design work, we're talking about how loud it is that people hear it. And we talk about loudness, which is the subjective perception of how big it is. Loudness, just like color with vision. It's a subjective uh, experience, rather complex. Yes, it is related to how big the sound pressure is, how much it goes up and down, and how quickly the frequency back and forth that it oscillates, but it is a subjective process and there's a lot of interpretation, a lot of change going on between what the microphone is, is picking up and the electrical signals coming off it and what's going on in our minds in terms of how loud it sounds to us. And the early studies uh, in the early and mid 20th century quickly led to, uh, to the development of some techniques to capture how subjectively loud it seems to people, and it quickly defined some units of measurement for that particular job, for representing the sound as it's heard by people. And the units that were uh, quickly developed were the fawn and the sone. Now the fawn, which is the more essential and elementary of the measurement units that are used in psychoacoustics, the science of capturing how things sound to people, the fawn emerged from a set of experiments which are very similar to what many of you may have had done at some point when you had your hearing checked. Many of you might have found yourself in a doctor's office, either in a medical surgery or perhaps when you went for an interview with a, an employer who was hiring you. You might have found yourself in a sound testing booth, similar to what's uh, shown in this picture here. The typical activity performed in these sound testing booths, they will put headphones on you to control very carefully how intense or loud or what amplitude, uh, if you wish to call it like that, we're giving you, and exactly what frequency of up and down oscillation of sine wave, sinusoidal wave, what's shown in the picture here, a nice simple sine or cosine wave going up and down. Those boots with the headphones, we can control very carefully what we're giving you. And the test is usually something of the type, we set the frequency on the dial to 20 hertz, we set a given amplitude we want to test, we send it through and you hear maybe something e, the sound wave sound, and then perhaps you push a button or raise a hand to say whether you heard it or you didn't hear it. Now this very simple test, if I start to change the frequency of the signal I send you, so one time it's eh, one time it's e, one time it's e, and I change the frequency or pitch in musical terms, and then I change the amplitude from ah to ah, I can do many, many combinations of just frequency and amplitude. And I can find out where's the border between when you do hear it and when it's outside your perception, you're not hearing it. And I can use that information to define, and this is what they did in the early 20th century, to define the unit of the phone. And the kinds of things that emerged from hundreds, possibly thousands of tests with, with thousands of people, once all the data was gathered and averaged together and some lines were drawn to connect the points that sound the same in terms of loudness, you get a diagram like this. Because not only can you do, as I said previously, to find what you hear and you don't hear, meaning where the first line is on this diagram that says perception or hearing threshold. But I can also make the test more sophisticated, which is what we're looking at now. And I say to someone on a scale of one to 10, how loud was this sinusoidal signal I gave you? Did it sound loud a seven, a three, a two, a five, a 10? And again, if I start to ask people also to judge it on a scale, so not just say yes or no and get the bottom line of this diagram. If I ask them to judge how loud it is and I take different numbers people give me and average them all together and connect the lines, I get this diagram here. 
frequency of the x-axis and you can see the range 20 hertz to uh, about 20,000 hertz as we discussed previously sound pressure level on decibels on the left hand side and every test point from the thousands of tests that were performed any point that sounded subjectively roughly the same loud as one of the others were connected with a straight line and this is what you're seeing here and what this set of lines is telling you is if I want to ask myself what amplitude and what frequency will give me the feeling of what a 40 decibel 1000 hertz uh, noise sounds like anything that's on the line that's marked as 40 is sounding about the same loud, loud. anything that's on the line of 70 or 80 or 100 all of those data points are sounding about the same loud. So these funny shapes, what are they capturing? They're capturing for you and me how our subjective feeling of loudness is modeled or measured or what it looks like as a function of the two parameters that were used in these simple tests, which is what's the frequency I'm giving and how big is its amplitude of the sine wave let's see what the person says so these diagrams which are referred to as fawn diagrams they capture what are the equal sensation curves equal loudness curves equal sound sensation curves there's several names that are in use in the literature any way you look at it there's equal in the name and then there's either noise, or sound, or perception, or loudness, or some other useful design term next to it. But the point is, here we have the frequency, here we have the amplitude. Anything that's on one of these dark lines is sounding roughly the same. Yes, the pitch changed, but it sounds about as intense as the other ones. And the funny shape we're getting it's got nothing to do with the microphone, nothing to do with the sine wave we use in the test. The funny shape, which is clearly not a straight line, it's not a linear process for those of you of uh, scientific and engineering persuasion. This complicated nonlinear relationship, that is the result of everything going on with our ears. That shape is the result of the pinna, the auditory canal, the eardrum, the ossicles, the organ of corti, the oval window, all of that, at the end of the day, as a final analysis, this is how frequencies get filtered. This is our hearing ability captured as a function of frequency and amplitude. And for those of you who play musical instruments, who enjoy music, who are familiar with musical scales, at the bottom of these diagrams, quite often people put a piano keyboard because the piano is the traditional acoustical instrument with the widest dynamic range. So for those of you who are familiar, you can see where middle C is down on the, on the scale and you can refer and see how the human ear is picking up differently the loudness coming off of the musical instrument as a function of the note you're playing. And please note, in all cases, the frequency range from 1,000 to 6,000 hertz, approximately, is the range where all the curves are further down towards the threshold of perception, meaning those are the points where the curves are most sensitive. Where these curves are low and they're down near the bottom, that's where you hear everything very easily where the curves go up, like at the beginning on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side, that's where gradually you're losing the ability to perceive it. So please note that the main response range, what's really important in the sound signal, is from about one to 6,000 hertz, which is exactly where our auditory canal does its amplifying. The fawn was designated the unit of loudness um, as a reference they took the 1000 hertz 
uh, test signal and said 1000 Hertz is roughly at the beginning of that important range of human perception. People are really, really sensitive at 1000 Hertz. Let's make that the reference. And any amplitude will calculate the decibels and that's what we'll call the curve. So at 1000 Hertz, the signal that had the amplitude of 10 decibels calculated from the sound pressure, that was, gonna, that was assigned the name 10 everywhere along the curve, to the right and to the left, because the 1000 Hertz was taken as the center or the starting point or the reference. The same thing for the 20, the 30, the 40, all the way up to 120. Each line, each uh, curve, excuse me, is given a name based on what was the decibels of the 1000 Hertz signal, because we decided to fix that one as the reference, because people are really sensitive to that. Now, over the years, uh, engineers and scientists have wished to develop electronic techniques to simplify the measurement of sound for use in engineering and design and so forth. And looking at these shapes, they're a bit complicated. So the question then became, I wonder if we can take at least a couple of them that are representative maybe of most of them. Maybe we can take a couple, simplify the shape a little bit, and make a filter weighting or an electrical filtering network to put in our electrical device and say, this bit of the device is representing the human ear. So we'll pass the electricity through this. When it comes out, this box, the electricity that's remaining, that's the one we're going to use to calculate how loud the thing is, because the box is shaping the electrical signals in the way the ear does. If the signal's at 20 hertz, it's not passing it very much. It's not very sensitive. If it's 30,000 hertz, it's not passing it at all. If it's 1,000 hertz in the middle, well, that's where the curve is lowest and most sensitive. The box is representing people. It'll send that electricity through from the microphone to the computer without much modification. So over the years, they looked at this and they said, well, let's take two of these. Let's call them the A and B frequency weightings. Let's take the 40 uh, decibel contour and the 70 decibel contour. So something at the lower middle and something at the upper middle. So something that's more curvy, the ones that are further down, something a little bit more linear and flat, something a little bit further up. And these two uh, engineers, Fletcher and Munson, early 20th century, they chose these two and they said, well, let's use those to make in electrical devices to measure and capture not the pressure coming from the microphone, but the pressure coming from the microphone after, after it's been through a device which treats it like the human ear does so we can see what remains and that's what the people should be hearing. And that's what we use on a regular daily basis. What's referred to as the decibel A, B, and C weightings, typically the A and B, the Fletcher, Munson A and B curves. These uh, electrical weightings are filter networks based on resistors, condensers, and, uh, and inductors. They're filter networks that are based, uh, built into either the microphone or more traditionally a sound level meter. The picture here on the slide shows a typical standard, relatively low cost sound pressure meter. You can uh, there's a microphone at the end where the foam uh, tip is, and you can see there's a screen re reading directly readings in decibels, and you've got some adjustment buttons that you can set, and you can set it to record the decibels coming right off the microphone with no change, or record them after they've been chopped and shaped with an A weighting, or after they've been chopped and shaped with a B or a C, and there's also a D and a couple others usually you can choose. And what that permits you to do is say, if it wasn't such a loud sound and the A weighting, which is towards the bottom, would be more applicable, what probably is the number of decibels in terms of loudness a person is hearing? Or if it's really, really loud, I might go for the B or the C weighting, and I might say, well, you know, this is a very loud uh, airplane with a, a loud engine. Let me try the B weighting, which is a bit up the curve. 
let's see what the B weighting would say, because that would be pretty close to what most people would say if I asked them the question and said on a scale of 1 to 10, tell me how loud it is. So sound level meters are devices where between the microphone and the reading scale, there's a filtering network. And the filter is none other than the curves we showed previously flipped upside down and shaped and smoothened to make it a little bit easier because to follow exactly all the zigzag of this is a bit complicated so it was smoothened and simplified by hand a little bit to make it easier to make with uh, electrical components the filter network and it's been smoothed and simplified and uh, reduced a bit and it's the flipped image so it's filtering or removing from the electricity of the microphone those frequencies which we as people don't hear very well because our ear doesn't manage to follow them or respond very strongly. And when we take a sound pressure level meter and we set it, for example, to A scale, which is the most commonly used one because most sounds of interest to us tend to be close to the Fletcher Munson of the A uh, type. Um, what do we see as the numbers? Here is a diagram from a famous company that makes equipment in this field and you can see that it's zero because it's the reference number in the denominator. If zero is the, is the reference for the threshold of perception, starting from zero, typically human beings sat their hearing abilities will range from zero to about 140 decibels. 140 decibels or 14 orders of magnitude, that's when we don't really hear the sound anymore. It just starts to become pain, and dangerously so. So there's a typical range. You can see uh, traffic or office work, whatever, where we tend to be. And it's very important in design of environments, in interaction design, so forth, to be very clear about the decibel levels we're trying to achieve, the minimum, the maximum, the background noise in the room, how it might interfere with that, and so forth and so on, because it's very important that something like a message, such as a chatbot, it's important to hear the words and not make mistakes in interpreting them. Your sound from your interface certainly has to be significantly above the background noise, and the difference between the two has to be measured in subjective human terms, the kind of thing this is doing, decibel A weighting. If we just measure the pressure from the microphone without trying to represent the human and see the effect, we could come to very different conclusions in many circumstances. Now, a couple more things to mention about sound. One term that many of the standards, the sound design standards, the acoustical standards, architectural standards for hospitals and stations and so forth. One of the terms that appears quite frequently in standards is the term annoyance. The term is used to describe unwanted noise. Very important not to be confused by this because annoyance is a subjective negative property of an unwanted sound. What is the difference, though, between how loud the sound is and its annoyance? Many of the standards are taking annoyance simply by saying that the thing we're trying to design is naturally not going to be pleasant for people. They don't want it, but that's an assumption. And annoyance cannot be directly measured. Sound loudness, how loud something seems to be to you, particularly if it doesn't have any particular meaning, such as a sine wave or a cosine wave, that doesn't really mean anything special to people. So when we ask people how loud that seems, that's really just a somewhat scientific measurement of how big it is. But annoyance means whether you want it or you don't. So many standards will use the term annoyance, but you're going to measure it with a sound level meter as loudness and there may or may not be some sort of a table or some other empirical method specified in the standard to get from one to the other because as it says at the bottom the two concepts how loud subjectively without any meaning to it without any particular importance to it 
how loud something sounds and whether it annoys somebody <laughs> are two rather different things. So be careful because a lot of standards will talk about annoyance, but what they're actually asking you to measure is the sound level, uh, the sound loudness, that's what's being measured, which is a more scientific uh, property. Annoyance is more subjective, psychological and sociological in nature. Sometimes the standards will provide you a bit of guidance on how to get from it's this loud and they'll hate it this much. Other times they won't and they'll just leave you confused. So be careful about that. The terminology is a bit tricky. And a related concept is sound quality. The same way a sound could potentially be annoying or upsetting in some cases, a sound can also be pleasant, uh, make people happy and be appropriate in other cases. So the same way there's a term called annoyance, but what you really measure is the loudness and then you sort of had to figure out whether they wanted it or not. There's also the question of sound quality, which is here we might be measuring the loudness or how well it reproduced. If this was a sound system like your home stereo or something on your phone or so forth, we might be comparing uh, how closely the reproduced sound in the, in the earphone is matching what was the original source, but that again is a scientific measure. So either we're doing a measure of the loudness or a reproduction accuracy, but people in the standard or people, customers asking the designers as part of the brief, they might be talking about sound quality, which is the subjective uh, quantity associated with the appropriateness or desirability of the sound. And just as the case of annoyance, we can measure some scientific technical parameters, loudness or reproduction accuracy, but that's not the same as sound quality. And if someone likes to listen to a sound through a good old fashioned analog amplifier, which puts some nice warm feeling through reverberation into your music, uh, that can't be captured with the technical means we usually use when we're designing things. So it's very important for the designers to, to make a few assumptions, agree a few points about what they're going to do about issues like annoyance and quality, because they're not scientific properties, they're sociological, psychological properties, and they're not things that can be measured accurately. Whatever we do is going to be an estimate. Now finally, a couple examples of design classics involving sound. Uh, one example, Kettle 9093 by Michael Graves for Alessi, 1980s. Uh, why this example? Uh, you may have seen this in the shops, or if not, you might have seen it in some books about design. It's a well-known artifact. The Alessi 9093 is, has a series of characteristics in which the idea of making a tea in boiling water has been taken from its purely functional, uh, purely, let's call it technical basis, and it, the artifact's been given an aesthetic, some project, some project, uh, product semiotics and semantics. It's been given a bit of personality, a bit of creativity, and it's been transformed into something which, yes, it does the job functionally, <coughs> but it's very decorative. It's an icebreaker which tends to start conversations when your friends come into your kitchen and see this there, and it starts up a conversation. Many, many artifacts are conversation icebreakers. These days they have a social function. Uh, the 9093 is something that's giving us a whole series of characteristics. One of its most innovative and unusual and unexpected characteristics is the sound. The small bird, which is at the end of the spout of the kettle, when the uh, water begins to burn, uh, to boil and become vapor, the vapor coming through, the pressure pushing it through the bird, there's a small whistle in the bird inside the plastic uh, casing. And the bird sings, it makes a whistling sound. And the whistling sound is not just random, it's not just a guess on the part of designers, 
uh, Michael Graves took as his target sound to try to match it as best possible, the sound of a European robin, a bird which most people in Europe and North America will be familiar with, will have heard millions of times, and which hopefully should bring to mind pleasant memories or a smile or something positive in the reaction of the person. So here we have an example of sound, specifically sound quality and the choice of a target so sound as part of the design brief. We have sound being integrated and being one of the key aspects of what the artifact does and how it comes across. So sound quite often isn't just a functional thing, it can be quite beyond that. And it's also, quite often, the core target of some design. And certainly there's many things in music and sound systems and so forth where it's very obvious that the sound reproduction or the other aspects of the sound control are fundamental to the artifact. But even in artifacts which aren't naturally based on sound, such as Kettle 9093, sound can be a very important characteristic to design for. Another example of sound which is a little bit less surprising, a little bit more intuitive, the sound of a Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson motorcycles from early 20th century, two cylinder V's as the layout of the mechanical, two large cylinders, because it's a big uh, engine, two large cylinders in a V configuration produces a very characteristic sound. So Harley-Davidson from the early years of its existence as a company has tended to produce products with this very deep, very loud, very intermittent, because there's only two cylinders, not four or more, a rather intermittent sounding uh, exhaust note this uh, company has built a brand, uh, to some degree, around that sound, in the same manner that Ferrari uh, builds some aspects of its brand communication around the color red. Harley-Davidson builds much of its uh, design philosophy and its marketing and branding around the sound of its V-twin engines, so much so that um, many years back now, they went through six years of litigation because they wished to patent or at least trademark the sound such that competitors such as Honda or Yamaha or other uh, motor motorcycle manufacturers could not make V-twin engines that sounded close to this sound because the idea was that is the sound that's specific to a Harley Davidson. It should not be that other companies can make machines that make a relatively similar sound. They tried uh, to ring fence it and protect it legally through trademark and patenting. They were not ultimately successful because cases were made that the other manufacturers had twin engine Vs uh, not that much later than Harley Davidson and have been uh, selling these products for a long time as well. However, it's a very good example of how sound can be a key aspect of an artifact's design and quite often a fundamental aspect of a whole company's business. Harley-Davidson is very uh, much dependent on this sound for conveying the spirit and also the usefulness of the artifact. And with that, we'll uh, finish today. Thank you once again for your time and your patience and your, atten uh, your attention. I hope that the discussion about hearing is of some benefit to you. Uh, sound is incredibly important in design. We only introduced a very small number of concepts today, but hopefully we've managed to convey a few points which may crop up routinely in your design work. So thank you very much.